NBC's Ken Delanian is outside that courthouse in Wilmington. Also with us, civil rights attorney and former prosecutor Charles Coleman and defense attorney Misty Maris. Ken, what do we know about what's happening with jury deliberations so far? Well, Anna, jury deliberations are secret, so we don't know what's going on inside that jury room, obviously. We do know that they were handed the case with only about an hour left in the day yesterday, and they began this morning at 9 o'clock. We saw Hunter Biden leave the courthouse uh, shortly after that. We know that the jury forewoman, who was assigned to, uh, as the forewoman, uh, has a sister with a history of drug issues, although is clean now, and is a regular watcher of the evening news. That's all we know about her. Uh, and so now the jury has the case and we wait Anna. the last thing of course on the minds of these jurors what were those closing arguments how did those go well the prosecutor leo wise gave a dramatic and impassioned closing argument where he talked about the evidence being personal ugly and overwhelming and he pointed to the prominent members of the biden family in the courthouse including the first lady jill biden and said this is not evidence you may know these people from the news but essentially disregard the prominence of this family and he said that no one is above the law hunter biden made a choice to buy a gun when he was an illegal user of drugs and he now has to live with the consequences hunter biden's attorney abby lowell tried to focus on raising reasonable doubts about the evidence about whether hunter biden actually was a drug user around the time he bought that gun. He had to overcome a text message two days after Hunter Biden bought the gun where he said he was using crack cocaine. And, and Abby Lowell's uh, story about that is that it wasn't real. It was him, Hunter Biden trying to um, tell his, uh, the woman he was seeing at the time that he was doing something when he was actually perhaps with another woman. That, that's going to be a tough one for the jury to swallow. It remains to be seen how it will play. Uh, and now we wait. And so, Charles, you know, some of the evidence in this case includes text messages, pictures, bank records, Hunter Biden's own memoir. Your thoughts on the closing arguments and what hope does the defense have for casting reasonable doubt in the face of straightforward evidence from the government? Well, Anna, this is a case where the prosecution had a very low bar in terms of what it is that they had to satisfy in order to prove the charges against Hunter Biden. The, the burden of proof is always the same. That's beyond a reasonable doubt. But in terms of the actual charges and its element, they were very straightforward. And I think that even as you have corroborating evidence, even as you have circumstantial evidence in order to prove the prosecution's case, there is a lot of evidence in front of the jury that speaks toward Hunter Biden's guilt for what he is charged with. Now, as far as the defense, they don't have great facts to work with. And so what they did during their closing arguments is that they attacked the timeline. They basically tried to say that the period that is in question may or may not necessarily line up with the notion of Hunter Biden's substance abuse issues. And so I think that that is as far as the defense could go, absent any additional testimony from Hunter Biden, which would not have been a good idea. So the prosecution has laid out a case that's largely built on circumstantial evidence, but one that nonetheless I think is pretty strong and convincing given the low bar around the elements that have to be satisfied for a conviction. Misty, Hunter Biden's attorney ended his closing argument by reading a passage from Hunter's book where he writes, remembering all those things feels like a terrible betrayal of where I am now. They prompt feelings of shame and guilt. What do you think the defense attorneys wanted jurors to take into deliberations? So to Charles' point, the elements of this case, the prosecution had a lot of facts to prove it, but there's one thing that they overlooked a bit, and that's that sympathy factor. For people that have been impacted, family, friends, by addiction, which at this point is almost everyone in America, and specifically some of the individuals on this jury. And when that passage was read, the defense had a very specific purpose. Number one, it's part of their case. Part of their case is, at the time, Hunter Biden was in recovery. He was trying to get better. And so the passages that you heard from this memoir, that's him looking back at this dark point of his life. These passages that the prosecutors brought in in order to prove his drug addiction. So the defense is strategically taking that passage and saying, this is not Hunter Biden today. Uh, this is Hunter Biden looking back on his experience. So there are absolutely times that he struggled, tried to get better, and unfortunately fell into the grips of, of doing drugs again, which is something that happens, relapses. So it was yeah. speaking to that sympathy level to the jury. So many people can relate to mm -hmm. the 
impact of drug addiction on families. Charles, Hunter Biden had this gun for just 11 days. There's no evidence it was ever discharged. He's not accused of using it to commit a crime. Remind us just how unusual is a case like this and, and does any of what I just laid out there factor into deliberations? You know, Anna, I don't necessarily think it factors into deliberations in as much as I don't necessarily know that the jury is aware of how unusual it is for the feds to bring a case of this nature. But for our audience, it's important to understand we've been having a lot of conversation about the trial in New York surrounding the former president and the notion of whether it was a politicized trial. What I can tell you is that this is a rare case to be brought by feds absent any sort of evidence or accusations of a violent act, which we do not have here. And what I mean by that is usually it's the fact that someone who had the gun in question committed some sort of violent act and that led to the actual indictment and these are lower charges that might accompany that we don't have that here and someone could make an argument that this is actually far more of a politicized prosecution than the one that we've been talking about that just concluded in New York I think that the jury is not necessarily going to think about that but it is important to note that it is a relatively unusual case for the feds to bring absent anything else that we have not seen here uh, in this case. Misty, of course, nobody can be sure, but what's your sense of how quickly we might get a verdict? I think we could see a verdict today. Again, the prosecutor really had a lot of evidence to show that there was drug use around that time, whether or not it was on the day of October 2018 during that month, but the circumstantial evidence surrounding that and the timeline that the prosecution set forth, pretty broad. But and they didn't have to prove that he used drugs correct. on that day, right? Exactly. And that was a point that prosecutors made because the defense, their goal was to narrow that timeline, to say we we have to look at this specific timeline in October. And keep in mind, there's two different there's two different aspects to the charges. One is the falsification, the lying on the form. The other is the actual possession of the gun. So there's two different aspects there that the jury is going through right now in that jury room. Uh, but look, I think if we don't see a verdict today, that's a good sign for the defense. That means that there's some there's some challenges in that jury room to all get on the same page, which is usually an indicator that there might be some, uh, there might not be a consensus or agreement, and so you could have the shot at a hung jury. That's right, because that would then lead to a mistrial, so it's not just uh, a verdict of guilty or innocent, or I guess a acquittal here. Ken, President Biden has already said he would not pardon Hunter, so what does he face if he is convicted? Uh, Anna, the technical maximum sentence for these three charges if stacked one on top of the other is 25 years but that never happened so the practical maximum here is 10 years but that's not going to be the sentence in this case by one estimate federal sentencing guidelines would call for about a year in prison in this case but it doesn't even have to be that those are voluntary guidelines the judge could go well below that given especially the context that Charles provided that this case is rarely brought as a standalone case. Also worth noting, though, that one of the reasons we're here is that a plea bargain in this case fell apart that called for no conviction on this charge. It called for a deferred adjudication. And so the special counsel felt compelled to bring this case after that plea bargain fell apart, Anna. Misty, what do you think? If found guilty, what's the more likely sentence here? I, I don't think you're going to see jail time. To Charles' point, when this case is generally charged, so the judge is going to look at other cases, what the sentences have been, and compare it to this case. It's usually what's called felon in possession, meaning somebody who is already been convicted of a felony, has possession of a gun, or the gun was used in some other crime. And then these charges are tacked on. So given that, this is such a rare case to be brought on its own. I don't see jail time in Hunter Biden's future, even if he's convicted. Your thoughts, Charles? I would agree with Misty and Ken. I don't think that this is something that is going to see jail time. And if it is, it's not something that's going to be significant in terms of its jail time. The judge is going to look at other cases of this nature. And you will not normally see anything close to the maximum imposed for something like this. And so ultimately, I don't expect Hunter Biden to be uh, behind bars. And if he is for any period of time, I don't expect it to be lengthy. All right, thank you all, Kendallanian, Charles Coleman, and Misty Maris. Please stay close. We'll bring you all back if we get developments. Meantime,